Elad, thank you so much for coming to South Park Commons tonight. Uh, you've seen startups from three key angles. You've been a founder twice, you've been an early employee twice, and you have informally advised or angel invested in hundreds of startups over the years. Uh, you write one of the standout blogs. I've actually been reading your blog for years and I love it. Um, every time I read one of your posts, I feel like I've gotten smarter. Uh, so we're very excited to have you here tonight. Oh, thanks so much for having me and thanks for hosting. Great. Uh, so quick audience question, poll. How many of you guys here have uh, actually heard about High Growth Handbook, which is Eli's new book? Great, almost everyone. Uh, how many of you guys are founders here? Excellent, it's really good to see that that's a pretty highly overlapping group. And for those who are not, you know, who didn't raise your hand in both those categories, you need to get yourself a copy of High Growth Handbook. Or start a company. Or start a company, that's right. <laughs> More importantly. Yes. Um, so, uh, I was going to start off with some questions about, you know, where you grew up and how you came to Silicon Valley, but I thought we'd instead start off with some spicy questions. So, first one is, why should, should not, why shouldn't people start a startup? Like, why should you not do it? Sure, yeah. Um, so, it's funny, anytime I meet somebody who started a company before who tells me that they want to start another one, I actually try and talk them out of it. Um, and I try to remind them of how incredibly painful and hard doing a startup is, but also, I think, um, especially if you're somebody who's had a successful exit before, the range of possibilities that exist in your life uh, may be broader than if you're straight out of school and starting something. And so I found some people fall into self-identification of I'm a founder and the only thing I can do is start companies over and over and over again versus asking what do I really want to do or you know, what are the, the range of options that are available to me now. And so one reason is just making sure that it's truly what you want to do or have you considered your full option set. And so I think it's, it's encouraging people to be thoughtful about it. Um, I think it's really hard and um, it's very emotionally taxing and so I think you also need to have a moment in your life where you're ready to go through uh, that grit and that need for perseverance because even the, the companies that do best tend to have very tough moments. Yeah, totally. That's really good advice. And what are some of the reasons why people should not raise money? Yeah, I think um, people definitely raise too frequently in Silicon Valley. In other words, there's or in general, like there's um, lots of companies that could be either uh, bootstrapped off of customers where you could raise debt as, as a mechanism. Um, and many people go on the venture capital train. And unless your company really is going to end up being a venture scale business where you're likely to have an exit in the hundreds of millions, you probably shouldn't raise from like a traditional series ABC. There are some angels who are looking for a smaller return. Um, or alternatively, if you actually look at um, some of the people who've done best in life, it's business people who started something and effectively didn't raise money. Like Michael Bloomberg is worth in the tens of billions of dollars because he only raised money once from Morgan Stanley. And it was like a small minority investment and it was late in the life of the company. Um, yeah, and so uh, you, know, you, you see these other models but they're not really present here. And so a lot of people raise money for potentially the wrong reasons. Uh, one is they think that um, the VCs will help them enormously and make the business, which usually isn't the case. They think that um, there may be some ego involved or some flashiness around the fact that you raise money, which again is a bad reason to raise. Um, or they may think that their business is gonna be bigger than it is. And uh, one friend of mine uh, started a social gaming company right as a Facebook platform launched. And there were four founders and they were generating something like 10 or $20 million a year in cash just off of ads and these really sort of crappy viral apps that they'd built. And uh, I mean, they were really uh, bad. And um, he, 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 he and I were talking about fundraising and he came to me for advice and I said, well, you shouldn't raise money. Like, why are you doing this? And he's like, I want to go big and all this other stuff and I want to make tons of money. He's like, well, you're making tons of money and you can go big, but you're, you're, you're generating cash flow. You can just go after that. Um, so he and his founders ended up raising, I don't remember what it was, a $10, $20 million round. And then they got on this venture capital train. They hired the team way up. They tried to build too many products simultaneously. They burned through all the capital and they went to zero. Um, and so that was a great example where a founder probably would have would have done better if they just bootstrapped off a cash flow. Um, and so I don't think every company should do it. I think it's helpful and it can be an accelerant and it, if you don't have the runway to do it, you can hire people or do other things faster. But fundamentally, I don't think every company should do it as a default. Yeah, so I mean, cash flow and profitability obviously would be a key indicator in this case. How do you know when somebody should raise venture debt? That's the one I'm less familiar with personally. Yeah, uh, venture debt has uh, two or three um, purposes. Uh, one is if you have a lot of CapEx. And so the traditional way that venture debt actually arose was you were a semiconductor company in the 70s and um, you needed to build a fab. Mm -hmm. And so you needed a bunch of money to sort of bridge you into something. Or you needed working capital because you were building hardware and you were buying a bunch of components ahead of sales and therefore, and, and you know, you get paid 90 days later 
and you're just going to run out of capital. And so sometimes they were used as almost like bridges. Um, the, the convertible debt instrument actually started that way as a way to bridge people, and that's why people used to call them bridge loans or bridge financings, even though now that they've, they've eventually morphed into safes in some sense. Um, so yeah, uh, today a lot of people raise venture debt um, if they've done a large venture round, and then they want an additional um, line of capital that's non-dilutive that they can, they can pull on if they need it uh, to be able to last longer. Um, the key thing to remember with venture debt is depending on who you raise it from, they may put all sorts of covenants or constraints around how you can operate. So once you start drawing it down, it may really limit what you can do. Um, or uh, the people who you raise debt from, um, with some counterexamples, uh, you know, if you're a VC, your whole um, approach is that one out of 10 of your companies is really going to hit it big and two are going to do okay and a bunch are going to go under. If you're a debt provider, uh, you're looking for, you know, say a 10, 20% return a year. If one company goes under, you're screwed, right? You don't have that outsized return off of things that are working. And so debt providers tend to be nastier if yeah. things aren't working. It seems to me just from observing the industry, there's kind of two ways in which debt has gone. One has, you know, like there are some projects like Open Door where you have like tremendous capital requirements and you'll yeah. go directly to Wall Street and you'll get like pretty big lines of cash. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is you're actually seeing kind of like this mass like venture debt-ish uh, rise up through things like Shopify Capital or Amazon has a capital program now and or even like Cabbage and OnDeck and they're providing venture debt to startups and small businesses. Yeah, that's a good point. And then separately, there's like working capital loans. or right. there's, there's lots of different ways that you can raise debt. Mm -hmm. um, so it really comes down to the purposes of your, the purpose of your company. Right, makes sense. So I wanted to talk about um, you and Rucci. So in your book, you and Rucci discuss the wolf role in fast growing companies. This is where uh, the company realizes there's a huge need and you have this often very trusted insider come in and, and fix this gap often hire a executive for the long term, and then they go on to the next need. And you played this role at Twitter. So my question is, would you still consider the wolf your startup spirit animal? Uh, maybe it's a werewolf, because I've reverted back <laughs> to human. So you know, the full moon's gone, and yeah. I wake up, and I'm all ragged. Right. <laughs> so I think that's probably my current state. <laughs> OK. Um, and you have a strong background in both biology and software. And so how intentionally have you woven those two threads throughout your career? Uh, it was very unintentional. Um, so I spent uh, the first decade or so out here working at different startups and then investing in different startups. So I um, was at Google reasonably early and helped start up the mobile team there. I um, uh, started a company that was an early data infrastructure company that Twitter bought. And then I started investing in different technology companies like Airbnb and Coinbase, Instacart, Stripe, Square, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I ended up eventually starting a company called Color Genomics, and that was, um, it's basically uh, genomics meets um, software. So, uh, you know, how can you uh, radically decrease the cost of genetic testing and make it more broadly available for people? But that was really driven by my co-founder's story in some sense. Um, so my co-founder, Amin, is very public with the fact that he himself is a BRCA2 carrier, so he's at higher risk for multiple different cancers. Mm -hmm. And he inherited it through his mother, who had breast cancer twice, and he's had multiple family members die of cancer. And so um, you know, really the impetus for the company was driven by that personal story of uh, there's a lack of access. Um, there's lots of people who are dying who shouldn't be, and therefore, how can we help with that problem? And so that, that, that's what really drove color early on. Mm, I see. So it sounds like you're echoing some of, um, you're agreeing with uh, Paul Graham's advice also. And like, you know, if you're a founder, start a company around something where you have a really deeply personal connection. I think that's true, but I don't think it's true for every founder. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a couple of um, uh, startup uh, myths that are a little bit overstated. I think that's one of them. Oh, really? Um, yeah, tell us about that. Well, I, I think there's um, a number of startups. So uh, basically what happens is um, the press always wants to write the compelling story about founders. And so you go and you pitch your company to them. And they say, well, tell us the founding story, and let's talk about that. And so everything gets reinvented in hindsight through the lens of the startup. You know, Ben at Pinterest was always collecting things on boards at home when he was five years old, or whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like the startup um, creation myth. I've heard oh, it described as that way, too. It's a great way to put you it. You always look at it post hoc. Exactly. And so, um, and then you dig in, and you're like, oh my gosh, all these people wanted to sell their companies really early. You know, the Google thing, where they were shopping it for a million bucks to... Mm -hmm to different buyers or, you know, there, there's, the reality is often very different from um, what's told in hindsight. Um, so yeah, I think, I think uh, a lot of these things end up being myths if, if you really look uh, very closely. And then there's a handful of people where 
it truly is a thing that they're you know ridiculously passionate about. Like Soylent would be a good example. Where it seems like you know that person really was self experimenting a lot, and then it, it turned into a product. Um, or Coinbase, you know, uh, you know, they really were into Bitcoin early, and so it was a passion thing. But I, I think it's very overstated, and you see all sorts of people start companies that, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, you know, Uber, uh, when it got started, um, uh, Garrett was the, the the sort of full founder, and Travis started off as a super advisor, and then became a founder. And they basically put in money, and as far as I remember, and I could be just remembering this, they like outsourced the app, they hired in Ryan to run it. And both of them were going to go do different things, right? And then it started working, and Travis came back in, and it kind of ran from there. And so I do think that, and they're very open about it. Like, right. if, if you see a talk with Travis, he talks about that, right? Yeah. And so um, I do think that uh, a lot of founders don't know that the thing that they're working on is going to work, mm -hmm. and um, especially in consumer. And so I think this, you know, it's not like Travis was driving taxis as a passion project before starting right. Uber or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I really like that analogy. It's a pretty funny image. Yeah. So how do you know when it's, what is the, what is the art and science behind then like figuring out, okay, this is the thing that's going to work versus I'm going to try to go shop it around and like get acquired somewhere or something like that. Yeah, I think there's a few things. Um, and I do think working, I mean, one signal really is you worked on something over and over and over again, so you're building it for everyone. I do think that's a real signal. And so yeah. Mailgun, which eventually sold the rack space, um, that was an example where they kept building email servers internally for different companies, and they said, let's just build it for everyone, right? Or um, there's other examples like that. Stripe, you know, as, as you were there, the, the, the founders pretty early on were like, this is something we would have used, and so therefore it's, it's interesting. So I do think things that you see multiple people need to use is, is a clear signal, or that you keep building over and over in certain companies. Um, so there is that direct experiential one. I think the other sign of real traction um, is compounding growth, even if of a small base. So people tend to discount things that have 100 people growing to 120, growing to 140, and it's growing 20% month over month, but you're like, it's such a small number that it doesn't matter, and you discount it. But if it's growing organically, and it's compounding, and it continues to grow, that actually is a very strong signal. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is if your product is really broken, and people still use it, that's a really strong signal of product market fit, right? And you see that all the time. There are these janky products, and they look awful, and you know, people kept talking about design for startups, and I was like, oh, that totally gets it wrong, right? Like, it's not design first, it's utility first, because it can look beautiful and it's worthless, and nobody's using it. That's actually a very negative <laughs> signal uh, versus a thing that's half broken and everybody's using it. Um, Twitter was a good example of that, where it kept going down. You know, there's always a fail whale. Like, when they bought my company, uh, the first thing that they had um, half my team go do is fix the deploy queue, because the company couldn't deploy, queue for, uh, deploy code for a couple weeks. And so we came in and we fixed that, right? And so, um, you know, and, and it worked, right? Because there was product market fit. So I think signs like that are very clear signs of product market fit and that your thing is gonna, gonna work. Yeah, it's like users are trying to take it out of your hands before you're ready and you feel really uncomfortable, but it kind of feels like they're right. Yeah, the way Mark Andreessen uh, puts it is the market pulls the product out of the company versus the company pushing the product on the market. And I think that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, it's a really interesting way to think about it. Okay, I wanted to t move on to some hard questions about um, founders. You I thought those were the hard founders. questions. <laughs> Got more. <laughs> Get prepared. So uh, on your blog, you've said that the two biggest reasons that startups fail are running out of money and founding team implosions. And so how should you know, we as founders think about proactively mitigating these risks? Yeah. I think the real reason startups fail is they don't get product market fit. Um, and uh, money, in some sense, is the clock that measures how much time you have to find product market fit. Uh, because if you have product market fit, you can either you know, bootstrap off your customers or raise more money. Um, founder implosions are something that, that screws that up for two reasons. One is, um, you know, obviously, it creates a bad work environment. People want to leave, whatever. But secondly, it freezes you in time because you keep arguing with each other instead of moving forward. And so it's really running down the clock and exhausting people when what they should be doing is focusing on, on building the business and the exhaustion should come from that work, not from fighting each other. Um, so really I think it's three reasons, not getting product market fit, um, fighting with your co-founder, running out of money, but it all ends up being symptoms of not, Which are not all getting actually product, not market getting market product market fit. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, so given that, um, but it all kind of weaves together, sure. right? And so how, how do you make sure that you can find, a, how do you know when you have co-founders that, you know, this is a good group and I want to go on this journey mm. where you're potentially like making lots of trips down some sure. frustrating 
Um, I think the optimal situation is that you've done something hard with them before and you get tested on that relationship and then that difficulty and that willingness to split roles. Um, so I think one key aspect is if it's somebody that you've worked with for many years, that's better than somebody that you haven't. Mm -hmm. I think some people sometimes confuse how they act together as friends from how they're going to act together as business partners. Mm -hmm. So I do think you have to uh, be uh, thoughtful about how you're going to work with friends. Because uh, sometimes also the relationship bleeds in too much into the business relationship. Right. Um, and so that can be bad or it can be a good thing. I think it goes both ways and it's very contextual. Uh, and then lastly, I think eventually um, you want to figure out who's actually in charge. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's very clear and it's upfront and it's like Steve Jobs and Wozniak and Steve Jobs is in charge. In other cases, it's um, very ambiguous and the founders will kind of fight and bicker over who's really kind of running the company or what situations should both or multiple be pulled into. Mm -hmm. um, so I think eventually, it may not happen very early, but eventually you need real clarity in terms of you know, um, who's really in charge. I think negative signals tend to be co-CEOs. Um, like if you can't agree on that, or um, if you say every decision is made together, and then there's no way to actually say, how do you break ties? Um, I think those are usually negative signs because it means both people want to be CEO and nobody's willing to relinquish the role. And if things go well, that may be fine, but if things go badly, it's going to be an inevitable fight. Uh, because you're going to start fighting over direction. Are there any counterexamples of co-CEOs that actually work? I agree that it's generally a negative signal. Uh, in terms of companies that have really worked, nothing I can think of. All the companies I know of where they had co-CEOs, Birchbox would be an example, but that... Robinhood. Oh, oh I didn't realize they were co-CEOs. Yeah, that's a good one. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not close to that team. Um, so I don't know how they made it work. Um, all the ones I can think of, like Birchbox or others, ended up uh, not working out to the extent that people had hoped. So, we should invite the Robin Hood founders so we can Which grill one? them about CEO. Oh, but that came later, right? Or was that from day one? Yeah, because I know eventually there are some big companies that do it. Eventually, I don't know if they started off that way. They may have, um, uh, but I, I think also SAP or somebody. Some some large companies have done this sometimes. Um, but uh, I think for an early founding team, it decreases the chances of success. And the one thing I should say is, um, you know, the only good generic startup advice is that there's no good generic startup advice. And so oh, everything's no. contextual. <laughs> so there's going to be that one team that the co-CEO thing works great. And then 99 other teams will copy it and it'll just be awful. And so I do think there's, there's that aspect of it. So anything I say, you should immediately discount uh, <laughs> relative to your own context. On your earlier point, um, there's a really interesting book called Founder's Dilemmas by Noam Wasserman, who's a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, um, somewhat of an expert on uh, studying lots of data about founders. And he talks about how uh, people who've worked together are most likely to succeed. And then people who are friends and then decide to work together are more likely to succeed in the short term. But then in the longer term, there can be mm -hmm. some issues. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that one of the kind of sources of attention can potentially be how do you figure out the rules. Mm -hmm. And so one question I have is, well, what is the role of a startup CEO? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the CEO ultimately has to do uh, three or four things. Uh, number one, uh, they need to set the direction for the company. So mm -hmm. where are we heading? Why are we heading there? You know, communicating that. Uh, two is make sure the company has money so it doesn't run out of money and is well capitalized. Uh, number three is hiring people. Uh, or ensuring that the right people are hired and trained and onboarded and, and all the rest. Uh, fourth is directing everybody against those uh, set of priorities. So the money and capital has to go in a certain direction, making sure that execution is happening. And then lastly, and I think this is the least talked about role, is um, you know, sort of that of a chief psychologist or a psychiatrist, depending on the company. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, if they have happy hour or not. Um, uh, and uh, you know that often takes up more time than people would expect because you then veer into certain aspects of people management that are unexpected for many first-time founders or people who haven't managed large teams before. And do you mean that quite literally about the chief psychiatrist, like you're talking to all the people, or do you mean kind of like it, indirectly you're setting the tone and the culture that then generates like you know fans out into all sure. these potential people-related? I, I think it's um, the former. I think the latter definitely happens, but I think the early team in general helps mm -hmm. propagate that. Although I do think the CEO play, or the CEO and founders play an outsized role in it. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that you'll end up with people coming to you with all sorts of issues that you never would have guessed are going to be issues. Mm -hmm. And as the company scales, that gets worse rather than better until you have a management team in place that effectively acts as a buffer for all the angst that any given person is feeling. Um, because if you think about it, say that you have 200 people on your team and each person has a bad day once a year, 
then you have 200 bad days to deal with, right? And so um, it can actually add up, um, irrespective of who you hire and irrespective of how happy people are and everything else. And it tends to filter up unless you have the right mechanisms to make sure that it's dealt with locally by the management team that you build out. Mm, yeah. Or yeah. the HR department. Right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is important to institute HR at a, some point in the startup. I think in the book you say somewhere between like 50 and 150 people, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, so obviously roles change all the time at startups. And so what are some of the ways in which you've seen people, uh, you know, successfully transition, founders in particular, successfully mm -hmm. transition roles as they get bigger, you know, CEOs get replaced. Um, what does the non-CEO founder go do? And we've seen like so many examples of this. Yeah, I think it's all over the map. Um, you know, I think, um, in some cases, uh, the, the other co-founders will take on very prominent roles ongoing. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, their role will continue to shrink. And, and sometimes that's because they really want it to. Sometimes it's not. So I mean, the Apple case would be the canonical example of Wozniak eventually becoming an individual contributor engineer. And that's what he really wanted to do, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. I do think there are people whose inclination is, I just want to work on something. I don't want to own an empire. In other cases, um, a common force, a, a place of conflict will be the other founder's role is diminishing and they really start fighting it. Or alternatively, they want to be the person doing the press or want to be the person getting certain types of exposure that's normally associated with the CEO. And then you have to navigate how do you divvy those things up or you know, um, how you want to think about that relative to your own role. Mm -hmm. if, if you're the CEO, if you're the co-founder on the other side, it's again a conversation or negotiation. Yeah. This is a perfect segue into asking about your company. Mm. And so you and your co-founder at um, Color Genomics, you started out at this co-founder CEO, you transitioned to an executive chairman role, and your co-founder took on the CEO role. Um, why yeah. did you make that change? Sure, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, we've been working together for almost a decade, mm -hmm. um, maybe even longer if you count things where we're at the same company. So we were both at Google together, then we started the company together that Twitter bought, then we worked at Twitter together, and then we started um, Color together. And uh, throughout that, whenever we had a company of our own, I was the CEO and he was the president. And after a decade or so of working together, um, three things happened. Um, number one, you know, it was time for him to run something and not mm -hmm. be the non-CEO. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, it was either him taking on the role or I, I, it never got to the point where we had a discussion where he was like, I'm leaving. But I think like, eventually yep. he would have said, I need to go do my own thing. Yep. Uh, so it was time for him to be in charge. Um, second, I was getting tired of the things that a CEO has to do. Yeah. Uh, and so. Um, you know, I, I sort of felt like I'd learned the things I need to learn, and it was time to move on. So it made sense from that perspective. And then lastly, we'd also hit a scale of about 100 people or so where people were bouncing between us for decisions. And we just wanted organizational clarity and we wanted to clean it up. Mm -hmm. So as part of that, I stepped down um, and uh, he took over, which I think was uh, the right decision in all directions. It sounds like it was pretty natural in this case. It, it was actually um, sadly overly natural because mm -hmm. um, I held office hours weekly after that for like a month saying, hey, if anybody has issues or wants to talk and you know, the transition's tough, just like come by, I'll be in this room and nobody showed up. <laughs> um, or people would show up and they'd put their head in and they'd be like, hi, how you doing? And I'd be like, you know, is there any issues? And I'd be like, no, I just wanted to say hi. So it was very, um, it was too smooth. It sounds like the CEO who transitions yeah. to a non-CEO role needs a psychologist of their own. Yeah, it was bitter. Yeah. It was awful. <laughs> it was awful. So. Wow, okay. And, and what does the president do? This is always something that's stumped mm. me. I've seen this role a lot. And, yeah. you know, I worked at Stripe. So, John, I would absolutely yeah. say that John has as much to, has to do with Stripe's growth um, mm -hmm. as Patrick has. Yeah. And they're both very unique individuals. They're also obviously related. Sure. I don't know how that plays into things or not. Um, but it is a bit of a, like, what does that even mean, right? Yeah, I think in general, um, a lot of titles are sort of what you make of them. And mm -hmm. so, COO is another one, right? right? Like, what does a COO do? And in some companies, it really is operations. In some companies, it's the business side of the house. So for example, Cheryl at Facebook is like all about the business. Um, in some cases, it's all the you know, finance and accounting and real estate and that stuff. In some, in some cases, so for example, when David Sachs joined um, Zenefits, when Parker was still running it, uh, David Sachs took on product and engineering because Parker really loved doing the sales. So I think it's literally whatever you define it to be. Mm -hmm. And I think president is a similar role where it's whatever you define it to be um, at Google. When Eric Schmidt came on board, Larry and Sergey were the presidents, but they didn't have any reports. But they were incredibly influential in terms of decision making. Right. And so, um, you know, there, there's there's all these different permutations, and honestly, it's whatever you make of it. I think um, 
you know, an, a good Google example in terms of pragmatism around titles is um, Susan Wachiki, who was one of the first employees there. She eventually ended up running YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I worked for her for a while while I was, while I was at Google. Um, you know, Google went through this period where it hired uh, people with all sorts of different backgrounds to be product managers. So Susan, I think she had a biology degree and then she worked as a marketing person at Intel. Um, George had a PhD in CS. Marissa, uh, who eventually ended up running Yahoo, um, was an undergrad in CS. And then um, Salar, uh, who was the fourth product director. They had four people basically running product under this guy, Jonathan Rosenberg. Um, Salar uh, was an undergrad in bio who just signed, sort of showed up and started helping, right? And he wrote Google's first business plan. And he wrote their first business plan, and he came yeah. up with AdWords along with one of the engineers, and he did a lot of really impactful Marginally stuff. useful guy. He's reasonably, reasonably <laughs> useful. Even um, though he's a biology He ended up running YouTube actually before <laughs> Susan as well, so he did a right. bunch of stuff. Yeah. And uh, uh, so they had all these random people as product managers, but suddenly they decided the only product managers that they were going to hire would have to have CS degrees. And they had to be super technical. And a friend of mine interviewed with him, and he was an undergrad from IIT and CS. He got a master's from UT Austin in CS. And then he got an MBA, and they're like, oh, he's not technical enough because he has an MBA. Um, and so uh, Susan was like, how do I get this person into the company? Because Larry is like saying, oh, we need very technical people. Yeah. And so she came up with the title of business product manager. And mm. she's like, oh, he's not, a, he's not a product manager. He's a business product manager. <laughs> oh, of course. Um, and yeah. so they hired him. <laughs> um, and so I think sometimes titles can work in both directions in terms of like convincing people to, to do one thing or the other. Yeah, that's really interesting. And now all the PMs who have MBAs have to scrub MBA off of their resumes before getting PM. Yeah, there's actually, um, there, was a, there was another person who was VP of NJ at Google for a while who would never admit to his MBA or the fact that he worked at McKinsey. Um, <laughs> yeah. So go figure. Yeah, that's funny. Well, it sounds like when it comes to roles, the key thing is just to kind of figure out how do we leverage this person's strengths, make sure they have enough, and have really clear communication about that. Yeah, it's, about, it's all about pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Yes, your book is full and your blog is full of pragmatism, mm -hmm. which I really love. OK, another tough question. Uh, you can ponder that um, mm -hmm. while you sip your water. How should co-founders determine equity split? What's the best yeah. way to do it, most optimal? So I think this is the other big myth of Silicon Valley, which is um, co-founders should always be equal. Mm -hmm. and I actually don't think that's true. Um, and I think there's two types of equality. There's equality and equity, and then there's equality and power. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if you have equality and power, then you run into the situation that we described earlier, where I think you end up with conflicts that um, can sink the company, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of equity, the models are all over the map. Um, if you look at the most successful companies, uh, and that doesn't mean all of them, and it doesn't mean that's what you should do, um, they actually often have unequal equity splits. So Facebook had like four or five founders. Zuck had the lion's share of the equity. LinkedIn, you actually, and you can see this all in the S1 filings, right, of these companies mm -hmm. as they go public. And you can see it on the website. It's a Mark Zuckerberg production. Yeah, that's true. In, in that case, it was extreme. Um, <laughs> yeah. So everybody here <laughs> should put their name on the website is the takeaway. Um, uh, Reid Hoffman um, had multiples over the next closest founder, and he had like three or four co-founders at LinkedIn. Um, Oracle was, I think, sole co-founder. Maybe he had one other person, but again, it was Larry Ellison. Um, Speaking of werewolves. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, Amazon was just Jeff Bezos. Um, and you go through all the companies. Dropbox, Drew had more equity, right? Again, it's in the S1. Um, and then there's Larry and Sergey at Google who are more or less equal. Larry had a, a, a little bit more. And I think that may have been a voting thing. I have no idea, but I'm just saying, like, you know, when they went public, he, he owned a bit more. Um, and, you know, there's other situations where there's equal, but it's actually more unequal in the most successful companies uh, more often than it's equal. That doesn't mean that that's the way to success. There's equal or very near equal like Larry and Sergey. But I do think it's a very overstated thing. Um, and it's one of the things that's given as sort of canonical advice. Oh, you should, you should always split equity equally. And I don't, think, I don't think that's true. I think there are cases where you should and cases where you shouldn't. But you should always think about um, decision making as separable from that. Yeah, and the Noam Wasserman book, he talks about how um, co-founders who kind of go like fast equal, which is like we're not going to think about it, but we're just going to split equally and then move on, uh, do much worse than founders who are slow equal. And so they also end up in the same equitable position, mm -hmm. but they've been very deliberate about that choice. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. OK, so I wanted to move on to hiring and managing, also a subject that's near and dear to many people's hearts here. Uh, so OK, so let's say I'm a founder, and I've never done this particular function before. How am I supposed to hire an executive for that area? Like maybe I have to hire a CFO or a head of sales? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the sort of uh, way I've seen it do best is you go and you talk to three or four practitioners in that area that are truly excellent at it. And excellence may be measured by 
people in your network point you to them as sort of the best CFOs or the best salespeople. And you don't go to them to recruit them, you go to them to get their opinion on, for your stage of company, what should you actually look for in a CFO? What should you interview for? What questions should you ask? Um, you know, what does the role even mean? You know, like a CFO at one company would be very different from another one. Mm -hmm. If you're in financial services, it may be very different than if you're at an e-commerce site or company, but also some CFOs are much more strategic than others and they may own other functions. Um, so I would just go and talk to those three or four people. Uh, so step one is sort of getting a consolidated view of what great actually is in the role. And it'll actually also come through the conversation. You'll see what those people think about and how they think, and that'll inform your opinion of what a great person is. Uh, second, I would write up a job spec, and then I'd circulate it to every single person who's going to do the, do the interviews. Um, because they may have a different opinion of what the role is as well. And if you don't consolidate everybody into a common view, people will be interviewing for the wrong things or different things. Um, and so, and then lastly, as you get interview feedback, you're going to want everybody to um, discuss not only the feedback, but the role to make sure, again, that people are in sync. Because, uh, you know, if, if you're a smaller team and you're hiring a VP of ED and you have um, a product manager, an engineer, or somebody else who may not have worked with BD people before, they may not even know what that means. They may think mm -hmm. it's a sales role or they may mm -hmm. misunderstand the seniority that you're looking for. So it's really important, I think, to do those few steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. And what do you think of leveraging uh, outside recruiters to help you in that case? I think for executive hires, outside recruiters are actually good. Mm -hmm. um, I think for individual contributors, they tend to be awful. But for executives, they have both a different network, and um, they may have good experience in, with some of these candidates before. Mm -hmm. How do you come up with the questions to ask these executives that you've not, you know, if yeah. you're not familiar with those functions, that you can sure. get it from these coffee chats? Um, but it's also so tailored to your company, right? Yeah, I feel like. Um, there's uh, two sets of things that are generic for your company and then one set of things that's unique to the role. Mm -hmm. And so the things that are truly unique to the role, I think you can learn from these coffee talks or from investors or advisors who are involved with the company who've hired or been that role before. Um, I think there's a generic stuff that you should look for in every executive and potentially every person, um, you know, in terms of uh, functional expertise, uh, working well with others, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's a set of things that are just obvious things that you want to look for in people. Uh, and then there's sort of the cultural stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like how, how do they live, the cultures or things that we care about. Mm -hmm. And you also say that, you know, in some t sometimes there's just no way to know ahead of time. You just have mm -hmm. to try it out. And um, one of the things you tell founders is that you have to give yourself some permission to screw up. And executive hiring is actually one of those areas because the cost of no action is much worse than your company will stagnate and you won't be able to yeah, totally. achieve the goals that you're interested in. Yeah, so if you don't hire a CFO that you need for three years because you're scared to hire or pull the trigger, that's much worse than making a mistake once and learning from it. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the other areas in which you think founders should give themselves permission to make mistakes? Uh, almost everything. Um, <laughs> You know, outside of like ethical issues, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think uh, I wouldn't make mistakes there and say, oh, it's, it's cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Once something starts working, yeah. um, there's so much, again, the market's pulling products so hard and things are just working. Most companies that grow really fast make so many mistakes and they screw so many things up and yet they still do fine. Um, there's, a, there's a few counter examples of that, like Friendster really kind of killed itself because of some, some decisions they actually made on the engineering side in some sense. Uh, but most of the time, um, you know, uh, there's just so much momentum that things uh, tend to self-correct over time. Mm -hmm. uh, the real issue is the magnitude of outcome or impact that you have. So, and I'm using dollars as a proxy for impact, you know, you end up with a $5 billion company instead of a $100 billion company. And that's often because you made some bad mistakes in terms of execution and strategic decisions. And often that just ties back to who you hired. And mm -hmm. it really ends up fundamentally being people issues. Right. Um, so uh, I think that's the biggest lever. But are you going to get to a billion or not is often just determined by the market, unless you're truly a founder who somehow managed to pull it all together. Mm -hmm. And there are some examples of that. But honestly, the market tends to dominate much more than the founder in the early days. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it comes back all to product market fit. Uh, it really does, and uh, you know, most early stage angels um, really uh, overweight team. They always talk about team, 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 and I think the team is important. But I've seen so many great teams die in a in a terrible market. Like the market really dominates and wins, and then I've seen some awful teams, just awful, mm -hmm. um, do incredibly well um, in a in a great market. Uh -huh. And again, the market won. Right? Yeah, that has nothing to do with the team. It has to do with the market just being so good. Yeah. 
And you and Mark Andreessen are on the same side of this. Yeah, and uh, it's actually um, the, the person who coined a lot of it is Andy Ratcliffe, who started oh, okay. Benchmark. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, and so, you and know. now co-founder of Wealthfront. And now, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, so you've talked with Mariam Nafisi, the founder of Minted, about you know the Nafisi framework for hiring senior people. Yeah. So tell us what that is, and how have you seen that put into practice? Yeah. Um, so uh, in my interview with her, she came. Uh, she she mentioned what I thought was a really interesting insight um, that I hadn't uh, thought of uh, on my side, which was um, that when you're looking at where you need to make senior hires, um, her view was that it's in uh, spots where the CEO doesn't understand the function or doesn't have the visibility. And so you need to hire on more senior people that you can trust because you yourself can't necessarily assess it. Um, so her example was she's not very technical. She needed a senior person to run engineering because she herself could not intervene or understand if it was being done well. But she was much stronger on design, and so she could hire more junior people on design because she could give them direction, but also she could tell who was quality and who was delivering and what was actually working or not. And so I. I um, uh, and the book sort of called it the Nafisi framework because I thought mm -hmm. it was a really nice way to think about at least a subset of the roles as you're, as you're starting to build up the company. Yeah, I like that framing as well. Um, so on the practical note, you've shared that a big determinant of candidate conversion, I mean, I think a very common challenge that a lot of us at Software Commons face is hiring. Mm. And so you've shared that you can con uh, convert candidates more quickly depending on you know, how quickly you interview them and then how quickly you make them an offer. Mm -hmm. And so given your wide involvement in lots of startups, what are the, some of the most interesting ways you've seen startups put this you know, into practice? Yeah, I think um, even to abstract out a level generically, yeah. your only advantage as a startup is speed, if you really think about it. It's either speed or like doing things that a large company can't do because right. it'll kind of let their channel focus. or screw them up or something else. Mm -hmm. but Large incumbents will always have more money, they'll always have more people, they'll always have more relationships and distribution. Like they're always going to be in a better spot than you. Um, so your only advantage is speed. I can't think of anything else. It's like speed and flexibility. Um, when you're closing candidates, the longer you take, the more likely they are to find another job or to wander off because they don't think you're interested. And so moving quickly helps close people or convert them uh, uh, better or at a higher um, uh, percentage. And um, there's all sorts of tactics you can do. So one is um, you, know, you, you bring them in for a series of interviews, and you schedule them immediately for the next day to do the final round and, and have an offer ready at the end of the day. Like, there's all sorts of things that you can do to try to optimize speed. Yeah. Um, or you can um, come up with a way to sort of front load uh, some of the things that you want to do with, uh, with tests or other things so that when they come in, you already have a reasonable assessment of certain parts of their skills, and you can, you can dig in quickly. So I think it's, it's more just asking, how long is it taking us, and why, and what pieces should we cut out of the process? Now, on their side, they're going to want to get to know you, so you can't necessarily same day just convert them, and it's done. Yeah. Um, but you do you want to sort of jam pack to. things in. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So it sounds like it's a lot about uh, you know, just being really thoughtful about the process and the candidate experience, and yeah. a lot of things will naturally fall out of that. Yeah. I was hoping to get some specific startup tactics out of that, too. but. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a bunch, but I don't think they're um, as cogent as the, the meta message of just like figure out what your process is and how do you cut time out of it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you want to you wanna build in a little bit of time for them to assess, but also have them stew on it. Totally. And stew on it maybe two days, not a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How should startups think about compensation at various stages? Uh, you know, one thing I don't believe that makes surrounds periodically is that um, early employees take on as much risk as founders. So I think that's sort of a common meme um, where, oh, I'm, I'm joining early and I'm taking on as much risk and I'm working just as hard. And in general, I found that founders, on average, tend to work harder than their employees. And um, it's a much more stressful job. And they're stuck with the ship. Like, they can't leave. Um, and so I do think that uh, that's overstated in the community. It's interesting, there's one engineer that I know who um, while he was at this company, um, kept saying that uh, he kept complaining about the equity that he had and the risk that he was taking. And then he went to start a company, and uh, the CEO of that startup funded him. And um, uh, he went back three months later and was like, I was totally wrong. It's like much harder. Um, and I really think that's true. So I, I think people tend to overstate the value of early people versus founders. Mm. But still, you, you think that you know, equity has, uh, compensation for early employees has evolved a lot, uh, especially in current times when 
uh, I think you make a point that, which I agree with, which is that a lot of times you're not necessarily, you are of course competing with the Googles and the Facebook for engineers, but it's just that there's so much capital nowadays that you're really competing yeah. with people becoming founders themselves instead of going and working at a fast growing company. I think um, whenever I used to hire people for my company and they said, well, if I went and became a founder, then I'd be doing better, I'd say, great, go start a company. Like, you know, go for yeah, it. There's nothing stopping you. Yeah. Yeah, but just so. inherently the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, um, so I wanted to move on to boards. Mm. Um, so you've said that if your co-founder is like your spouse, your board members are like your mother and your father-in-law. Mm -hmm. So how do you pick the right board members for your startup? Yeah, and, and it's true because you know how you have to see your in-laws at Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate. It's hard to get rid of them. Uh, you, you, you show up and you're like, hey, let's hang out again. So, um, uh, and then they, but they also have uh, power over you, uh, sort of like your in-laws. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, getting rid of board members is very hard, particularly if they're investor board members, because usually a VC will get a board seat um, as part of the investment and they have control over who takes that seat because they want to protect for the fact that somebody leaves their firm, they can still fill the seat and have governance and control over the company. Um, independents are much easier to get rid of actually than, than investors. Uh, the primary way I've seen people get rid of investors is let them uh, get bought out as part of a secondary, at least partially. And then as part of that, they say, well, your ownership is dropping below a certain point and you're sending a signal to the market and therefore you should step off. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen people largely kind of buy board members off. Um, sometimes you can actually um, uh, negotiate it with the firm, but that means you have to have a relationship to the senior most partner at that firm, and they need to be willing to back you in terms of swapping out a board member who isn't working out from their firm. And it's really hard to do because the firms often are almost like families, right? I mean, they've worked together for 10, 20 years, and it's hard to they're go to somebody small, and say. Their partnerships last a long time. Yeah. So they're be very fraught relationships. And they're very dependent on each other. Members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's really hard. Yeah. At South Park Commons, we have a opposite sort of attack, uh, which is when people raise, you know, over a million dollars or some other mm -hmm. um, milestones. We celebrate them, and they alumni and graduate out of South Park uh, Commons, and you're like, ah, oh, you're your own company now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can see that uh, graduating board members off is pretty difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is a question I've had for a long time, and I've gotten, you know, various bits and pieces of. But how would you say, like, what is the function of a board? Um, I think a board serves a few different uh, uh, purposes. Um, I think the biggest one is selecting the CEO um, because that really drives the rest of the company. So really the purpose of the board in one form is to hire and fire the CEO. More broadly it's to provide governance and represent the interests of all the various shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so you know, even your venture investor is actually supposed to represent common as well as preferred, not just preferred because they're a board member and they have governance um, over the entire company. Uh, but usually what that translates into is um, approving certain things that contractually they can approve, but then also um, selecting the CEO. And there's a bunch of other stuff they do in terms of hiring and strategy and all these other things, but realistically that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Ends up being quite tough though. I mean, if you're, you're really a preferred shareholder and you're supposed mm -hmm. to represent the interests of both common and preferred. Yeah, it seems it, really difficult. In real yeah, life. I think uh, in reality, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't, and it really mm -hmm. depends on the context. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes the other way too. Like um, there are investors who've been too friendly to the CEO. Maybe the CEO should go, and they're doing a terrible job, yeah. but they're trying to be founder friendly. Um, and then what should they do, right? As founders, we're like, of course they should leave the founder in place, right? But um, in reality, for the employees, for everybody else involved with the company, for all the shareholders, it may be better for the CEO to go. Yeah. So you know, it, it kind of cuts both ways, actually. And now you even have extreme examples of like Benchmark suing, you know, a CEO mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. you know, have certain governance changes. Mm -hmm. It's quite different than anything before. Yeah. So how should founders manage their board? I mean, obviously, oftentimes the boards are, you know, people who are much more experienced. There are yeah. investors who have invested in many, many startups, not just mm -hmm. yours. So sure. how do you deal with that? I think the single most important aspect of board management is, if you can, selecting the right people up front because then it becomes much easier. I think if you do sort of a shotgun fundraise and you don't really know the individuals and you haven't really diligenced them, yeah. then you kind of get what you paid for in some yeah. sense. Um, so first step is making sure you have the right people on board. Um, second step is figuring out what's the right ways and times to tie into those people. What can they be most helpful with? 
um, and how do you want to interact with them. Um, Reid Hoffman has this great line around how board members are people that you would have co-founded a company with, or people who are exceptional that you would want to hire into your company but you can't because of their stature or because of what they've done in the past or because of their position. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's what you should really look for in a board member, somebody who can be that helpful and that sort of integrated into your team. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, OK, so I wanted to talk a little bit about scaling. And so as a company scales, how do you distinguish between an old timer who can actually scale and an old timer who should move on? Yeah. Um, I think as a company grows really fast, um, well, so say that you're the first designer on a team, right? And so you've designed the entire product. And um, the company grows, and the surface area of the product keeps growing. And suddenly, you need to hire two more designers. And so suddenly, you have a third as much of the product as you used to. If you're dividing it up equally, some people deal with that very badly. And they start to fight around it, and they start to drag their feet, and they get really upset, and they don't want new processes, and they don't want anything to change. Um, you know, they're used to the days when they, they were sitting next to the CEO at lunch all the time, and suddenly they're, they're not doing that, and they don't have as much influence. Um, and I think in general, the thing that people have to realize is that at any high growth company, in many cases, your role is going to shrink, and then it's going to expand again. And as long as you can navigate that emotionally the right way, you'll be perfectly fine, and you'll probably take on more and more responsibility over time, because you'll understand the context of the company, and you'll have the founder and executive relationships, and you, you know, you'll move up. Um, but if you act really badly relative to that, then you'll end up in a really bad situation because eventually you'll, you'll have to leave. Right? Um, and so often what it comes down to is that willingness to try new things and that self-awareness that things are going to shrink for you individually for some period of time, but in the long run you'll have enormous opportunity if you stick with it, and that willingness to subsume ego and emotion to go through that journey. Yeah, Molly Graham puts it like, you want to give away your Legos. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a recognition of um, what you're saying, which is like in the short term, you're going to have to give away some things that you're used to doing. But uh, it's long term, a better foundation for the company. Yeah, if it was Legos, I wouldn't give it away. But if it was something else, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I would. Right, yeah. You pick good, good yeah. taste in toys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Legos are great. Yeah. Um, so during your two and a half years at Twitter, the company grew 10x. And mm -hmm. then again at Google, uh, actually previously at Google, um, you know, they 10x the employee base during your four years there. And so what do you think, to what extent does culture evolve organically versus in this directed manner? Um, it does both. Mm -hmm. And I think a common mistake the founders make is that they won't let go and they think that uh, culture is never changing. Um, and in reality, uh, if you're 10 people, you're going to, have a set of cultural mores that overlap with but are different from when you're 10,000 people. Um, and that's just inevitable, not only based on the people you hire, but the way you need to operate and the way you need to approach the world and think about things. And so the key thing is to figure out what are the two or three core elements that you care about and that you want to continue to reinforce um, versus the things that you actively want to get rid of and the things that you want to actively incorporate as new things. Because there may be new things that you've realized. I mean, if this is a 10-year journey, you're going to learn things. And you're going to realize, oh my gosh, we should have incorporated this thing. And you know, this, the thing that we had earlier on just doesn't make sense anymore. Let's get rid of it. Uh, so I think you really need to view it as like something that just like every other part of your product, your company, everything's evolving. Your, com your culture should evolve too. It's just normal. Yeah. You've got to figure out uh, what are your sacred cows and what are the things that exactly. you can let go of. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you reinforce behavior around it? Mm -hmm. That's the hard part. Uh, it's definitely the hard part. There's lots of different tricks to it, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So what are some signs that a company is growing too quickly? Um, I think there's a bunch of them. Uh, one of them is uh, people clearly not doing what they're doing, knowing what they're doing, or why the company is doing certain things, or what's the overall direction of the company. So just, mm -hmm. you know, can people tell you why they're doing things and for what purpose? Um, I think uh, the degree to which somebody can jump in and start contributing is sometimes a sign of how good you're onboarding people. So if it takes them six months to ramp versus two months, that may be a sign that they're, you're either hiring the wrong people or it's a chaotic environment. Um, Facebook famously has this boot camp where you commit code mm -hmm. on your first or your second day. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a great example where they've sort of systematized how do we get people shipping early. Yep. And that's a good cultural reinforcement around ship yeah. uh, fast as well. So, um, so I do think that you can, you, there's actually all sorts of signs that you can see in terms of whether a company is effectively onboarding people or whether it's just a mess. Mm -hmm. What are some of the better ways that you've seen people onboard or create an onboarding program? Yeah, I think um, the Facebook is a good example. I think also um, there's a study, uh, I'm trying to remember if it was McKinsey or who did it, that 
you know, the first two weeks of an employee can sometimes really determine their path, um, just in terms of people viewing them as good or successful or not, them being happy about their job. You know, somebody's showing up and they took a big risk on your startup, and if they have a terrible experience in the first two weeks, that may set the tone ongoing, uh, versus asking, how can I make it a great experience? And so even little things like, um, you know, at Color, we would have these onboarding packages for every new employee. Well, first, when somebody accepted, we'd have multiple people from the company uh, reach out and congratulate them and all the rest, but then they'd show up and there'd be a book about, um, as the Emperor of All Maladies is sort of the book about cancer. We'd have the t-shirt. We'd have um, schedule in terms of who they're meeting with sequentially during that week so that they could get to know different parts of the org that were relevant to them, um, et cetera, right? You can, you can create a whole program around it and actually package it in a way that feels very welcoming and nice and warm mm -hmm. um, so that people feel like, oh, I'm really happy that I took this job. And I think that attitude really sets a lot of the tone. Yeah. It's hard to take time to do that as a startup. There's just so much going on. It's really hard. I think one um, piece of advice for an early stage company, if you're five, 10 people, is hire what I'd call a gap filler. Mm -hmm. So um, somebody who is uh, uh, kind of, I think a wolf is like, um, you know, uh, is, is like the late version of that where you're building up functions. I think this is more like, there's all the stuff you have to do as CEO that may not be the thing you should be doing, or alternatively, there's extra stuff that could happen if you had somebody who could just come in and uh, tackle real estate, and tackle food ordering, and tackle onboarding, and tackle all these other things. And sometimes they're an office manager, sometimes they're a BD or marketing person, who's, or an operations person who can do other things. At Color, we hired a really talented uh, person who um, was undergrad at Stanford, a Rhodes Scholar, and um, who's reasonably early in her career, and she came in and did amazing work, but uh, one of the first things she did was really gap fill a lot of that stuff, as well as doing BD deals, and as well as doing a bunch of other stuff. She also did the onboarding, and she also did the real estate. How many employees in was this? We hired her as employees six or seven. Oh, wow, so actually really early. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it makes a big difference. Um, other people call it like a chief of staff, mm -hmm. and you know, similar thing. Mm-hmm, right, yeah. Interesting. Well, I think of the chief of staff as more focused usually on you know one or perhaps two founders and leveraging their time. And it sounds like this gap filler is very focused on the company. Yeah, and, and I think I think it's all fluid they're very titles. similar. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay, so here's a, kind of a deep area I wanted to talk about um, psychology. Mm. So you advise a lot of startups. Tell us about a time when you helped a startup founder who was facing a potentially company breaking moment. And how did you help them turn things around? Um, the main company breaking moments early are uh, back to what we were talking about, which is um, the substantiation of it would be running out of money or fighting with your co-founder. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's lots of companies that I've seen uh, get close to run out of money, and then you know it's just helping with fundraises and it's, it's basic mechanics. Mm -hmm. I think the much tougher ones are when there's founder conflicts. Uh, there's one company that I wasn't an investor in, but I was just helping them out. It was it was a friend of mine. And um, you know, there was a big co-founder blow up there, and uh, they ended up actually selling the company instead of fixing the co-founder issue, which is really unfortunate because they were working on some really interesting things. But I think the founders got so tired of beating up on each other yeah. uh, that they decided to exit. And so I helped him uh, with that exit in terms of introductions to different M&A teams. And what should like those that. founders have done? Like you know, six months before that implosion, which yeah. should I mean, there's there's a few things. One is setting expectations way up front in terms of who's the decision maker. Mm -hmm. Um, they did that, but the issue is if things aren't working, mm -hmm. the person who's the number two person starts arguing about it. They're like, right. no, 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 my decisions now count because you blew it on the first try. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why that power dynamic really matters over time because everybody says, oh, when you know, we get along and we make decisions together, everything's great. You're like, wait until it goes really bad and it stays that way. Then how do you make decisions, right? It's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. um, so A, they should have uh, ensured that they had the right thing in place there, but it's hard to do that. Like sometimes people's minds change too. Right. Um, second, and this is the advice that I gave him, I said, you should let your co-founder go. You're the CEO, and you're not working well together, you're destroying the company, you're doing all this great stuff. You should let them go or you should leave. Yeah. Um, and instead they decided to sell, but I think uh, there's other situations where I've seen a co-founder leave, and that's, that's usually the right thing. How do you know whether it's something you can you know, work out through mediation or you know, getting uh, coaching is becoming very popular? Uh, versus you should really look for some sort of good exit. I think you should try all those things, but if none of those things help, mm -hmm. you know, at some point somebody has to go. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. It's really tough to go through founder breakups. Like, if you have to do that, what are some of the ways you've seen people better manage it? 
or communicate yeah, with Yeah, I think the key thing is to put aside emotion and focus on what's fair on both mm -hmm. sides. So, um, you know, in both cases, you have people who've taken a bet on each other. Mm -hmm. They may have devoted multiple years of their lives to making something successful. Um, the intentions were really good. And I think you really need to honor that and say, you know what, this person's been instrumental to getting things up and running. We've hit a point where we just can't work together. It's business, it's not a personal thing. And let's solve for everybody doing well through this outcome. Yeah. I, think that, I think it's really trying to pull back and, and focus on rationality if you can. Right, yeah. Startups are really, really hard. Yeah. Have you personally ever wanted to quit? And if so, how did you pull yourself through it? Yeah. I mean, in some sense, I did step down from color at some point. Um, it wasn't because I wanted to quit, but more because of the other issues that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but I think every founder at some point in their life um, uh, you know, goes through tough periods. Uh, you know, when I was operating, there was never a moment where I truly just said, hey, I should just give up or something. Um, you know, honestly, I, like, I, I, I tend to be overly brutal in terms of grinding through things sometimes, and maybe that's actually bad behavior. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who ran a company for five years that didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it was clear in like year two that it wasn't working. Yeah. So from a life opportunity cost perspective, maybe that person should have quit. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that keeping on is always the right decision. Like sometimes it's actually better to say, you know what, I'm going to shut down the company and I'm going to return money. Or you know what, um, I'm, going to, uh, uh, I'm going to exit. Or you know what, I'm just going to restart this whole thing with a different team. And uh, restart may mean you know that you help everybody find jobs and you return money and then you start something new that's different and different direction and different people. Um, I think people sometimes, uh, I think most people quit too early, but I think a lot of people quit too late. And it's really hard to know when. And I don't have a good rubric for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, do you know TomTom, Tom, the European GPS company? Like for a while, you know, people would buy GPS devices. Um, TomTom, I met the founder of it um, a couple years ago. And they were four people for like six years or something crazy. And they're just trying idea after idea. And then suddenly the GPS thing worked and they were like one of the biggest companies in Europe for a while. Yeah. Um, and it's like Angry Birds. They you know, made Angry Birds as the Rovio Game Studio for, and they made like 70 games or something before huh. Angry Birds. And then How long did like, they take them? I don't remember the specific, but it was a number of years. Yeah. So you hear stories like that and you're like, ah, oh, never give up. Um, <laughs> and then you see like, you know, thousands of people spending the best years of their lives grinding on something that's never going to work. Yeah. And so the question is, like, what's the right direction? And it's really hard. Like, I have no Your idea. friend actually sounds relatively lucky if in year two it was pretty obvious that it was going to take off or it was, you know, kind of flatlining. Yeah. Where that's pretty early on. It's reasonable to kind of give a couple years. Yeah, but they kept going. I mean, so, um, I mean, the hard thing is every company feels like it's not working. Not every. Most companies feel like they're not working after a year or after two years, and so do you keep going or do you quit? Um, mm -hmm. And what are signs of traction? Um, I think the flip of it is the very biggest companies, not the, you know, and this is huge exits, $100 million, $1 billion dollar exit, or whatever, the, the companies that end up being worth a lot yeah. tend to work early. Like, it's really clear um, that they're working. Because again, the market's trying to grab the, the product out of your hands. It's not like you're trying to put exactly. it in people's hands. Yeah, well, I, like a good example of that, um, a company I invested in uh, for their seed was PagerDuty, which is like an ops software company. You know, it does PagerDuty, which is kind of self-evident. And uh, you know, when they were raising their seed round, they had, and I may be just remembering this, Apple as a customer, Amazon as a customer, they had dozens of paying customers. Nobody was funding them yeah. for at least the first couple months um, because it was considered too niche and boring. But you're like, oh my god, look at this organic traction. Yeah. And it was growing 20, 30% month over month. It was just like this thing that was working. Who needs funding uh, when you have revenue from customers? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, That's amazing. I did not know that about Patriot. Yeah, yeah. It's so I, ubiquitous I, now. Yeah. So I just think it's one of those things where um, that one was clearly going to work, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective. And how early on was that in the company in terms of years the founders have been working at it? Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was a year-ish in. I could be wrong on that. Um, they'd built a similar product, I think, before at Amazon, if I remember correctly. So they'd actually built PagerDuty at Amazon for Amazon employees, and then they went out and just built it for everybody else. Um, it, was, it was a bunch of Waterloo folks. Um, and so, you know, it was one of those examples of, hey, we're building this thing over and over again. Let's, let's build it for everybody. So, I mean, I think one of the most difficult things about being a founder is managing your own psychology. Mm. How do you manage your own psychology and how do you advise other founders to manage their psychology? Yeah, um, I think it's really hard. Um, 
I think Paul Graham makes the argument that one of the reasons you should have a co-founder is you kind of level each other out. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, one person's excited, the other person's sad, whatever. Yeah, you um, pull each other back up. Yeah, and so I think there, there's that mechanism. Honestly, I don't think you need a co-founder for that, although that's one way to do it. You can just have yeah. other team members um, that, that are there. I think also the real thing is that most of the time, most of the problems are not existential. And I just ask myself, is this really a company killing thing or am I just freaking out? You know, like, um, okay, one of my employees quit. Is that really gonna kill the company? Or is it gonna hurt morale for a week and then most people are just gonna move on? And so I do think most people really overstate the likely implications of things in both the positive and negative direction at a company. And you should just really ask, okay, what's really gonna happen? You know, well, first principles thinking, does this matter? Or in either direction, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of, I think, I'm, I'm really enjoying a lot how a lot of your advice is about kind of like taking the emotion out of it, but mm -hmm. being just like very rational about like what's the situation and kind of like mm -hmm. what are the paths forward? And then given those paths, what should I do about it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's really neat. Um, okay, so I wanted to switch things up a little bit and do a lightning round where I ask mm -hmm. you uh, an a, qu a question okay. and you answer in maybe 30 seconds or less. Okay. How does that sound? Sounds great. Okay, awesome. Is that the first question? Huh? Is that the first question? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Aced it. Nice. Uh, so what do you think early stage founders should optimize for when fundraising? Is it speedy process, high valuation, or low dilution? I think it's the people that they want to work with over the next six to 10 years. <laughs> that was a really good answer, non-answer. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I've seen people raise it too high a valuation. So for both companies I've started, I actually never took the highest term sheet. So I think <coughs> high valuation is the wrong thing uh, to optimize for. The flip of it is, it's sort of like Goldilocks, right? Uh, you, don't want it, you don't want dilution to be too high, you don't want valuation to be too high, so you want the thing in the middle. And it's hard to know exactly what the thing in the middle is. Yeah. Um, so you, you try to have a fair valuation that doesn't dilute you too much. And you want to do it quickly if you can with the right long-term partners. I would absolutely trade off valuation for great people because it does matter if, if you're doing something for six, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. What's the one thing you'd like to be known for in 10 years? Oh, geez. Um, hopefully, like, uh, that I've helped uh, some good people and good companies along the way. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've already been doing that. I'm trying. What's your advice on navigating the dreaded office seating charts? Oh, uh, it depends on the size of company. Um, I think if you're, I think when all said and done, the best way to do it is uh, have people sit with people that they, uh, work with a lot and then have flex space for people to congregate. Yeah. Surprisingly, just like this really political thing that you think is going to be so straightforward yeah. and it never is. That in kombucha. Kombucha. Yeah. Like whether you should have kombucha exactly. in the office or not. Yeah, okay, so, so should you have kombucha in the office? No. <laughs> <laughs> should you have dogs in the office? Uh, my opinion is no. Um, the first thing, or one of the first things Altman did when I left is implement a dog at work policy. Oh, man. Um, I, th I think uh, that there are people who are allergic to dogs, people who are scared of dogs, and so I, I tend to avoid it, but Google had the policy and Color has the policy now, and it, it works fine. So, What have you personally gained from angel investing and advising startups? Um, I've gained a few things. Uh, one is um, I, you know, I've, I've made some good friends over time, so some of the companies I've invested in like I'm now friends with, and you know, some of the people who back me I'm friends with. So. Uh, that's one. Two is just like uh, knowledge of cool things that are happening and sort of tapping into a deeper network of like interesting things that are ongoing. Um, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, you always hope that you're going to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. And then you always hope that you're giving back or sort of paying it forward. Mm -hmm. yep. Why did you decide to include so many interviews in your book? You, I mean, you have a lot of writing to include already from your own. Yeah. Um, I thought that it really helped bring some of the topics to life. And so, and also I thought it brought in opinions that um, were con contrary to my opinion. And so back to the thing around startup advice being contextual, there's lots of different ways to do things. And people may argue ad nauseum about them, but really it's pragmatically about what's gonna work for your company. And so bringing in other voices, I felt one brought in other ideas, but also it brought in, um, in some cases, opposing viewpoints. And I thought that was good. Yeah, totally. What's one of the controversial what is the controversial statement that you would, like, what is the statement you consider controversial that you ended up including in your book? Oh, uh, in terms of something I said or in terms of something Somebody else said? Somebody else said. Um, 
Well, I mean, there's, 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 it's all contextual. So, for example, um, in the interview with Naval, uh, you know, there's a lot about either profit sharing or alternative models, and I think that works well in the context of AngelList, but I think it may be harder to implement sort of generically. And so, it's less about controversy and more about context, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of what types of startups you're looking at mostly yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to end on a more kind of philosophical note. Mm. What is something kind that someone has done for you? Um, I think there's been uh, a lot of kindness over the lifetime of me being out in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I moved out here, I, I had, uh, uh, you know, I just got my PhD. It was in biology, which is very random. I also have degrees in math, but, you know, it, you know, it kind of showed up here. The last bubble was collapsing. And I had no money, and I didn't know anybody, and I just kind of showed up. And a number of people, uh, I, m I moved here for a job, but then um, I joined a company that was 120 people. It grew to 160, and then it shrank to uh, 12 people over five rounds of layoffs. So I got laid off in the third round. Um, so I managed to make it through two. Um, and uh, they actually did the layoffs really badly. Um, one word of advice is when you do a layoff, just do a really big layoff deeper than you think and get it done. Um, but they did the sequential drag it out thing, and you keep burning money throughout, which means you're screwing the company even more. So, um, so I got I got laid off in the third round. Um, you know, I was literally sleeping on my floor. I didn't have a bed because I couldn't afford one. All this stuff, and uh, there's a lot of people who basically said, you know, let me introduce you to this company, or let me help you uh, meet some people, or you know, it was basically um, a lot of people sort of uh, paid it forward uh, when I was sort of moving out here and struggling and figuring it out. So. I do think that, uh, in general, over the course of my entire career, I've seen a lot of people act really well. And then I've seen some people act really badly. And you know, it's just both things happen in any human endeavor. And I think uh, we need to remind ourselves that we're all people and you know, shit happens. Yeah. And it's the community that pulls you back out of that hole sometimes when you're sleeping on the floor and you need the Oh, yeah, the totally. And I, leads. You know, I think when all is said and done, um, there's so much negativity about tech in the press right now. And I think uh, some of it is merited in terms of the mistakes companies have been making around data privacy or other things. But I think some of it is very overstated and part of a press cycle. And I hope that people don't lose <coughs> fact of the site that there is a very vibrant community here of people who help each other. And technology is a force for good and something that can help you know, literally billions of people now in terms of the reach of the internet and mobile. And so I do think um, that's been getting lost lately. But it's a really important thing to keep in mind that you know, everybody in this room can do ridiculously amazing things and can accomplish things that are going to impact hundreds of millions or billions of people if done right. So, you know, don't lose track of that. Yeah. That's why we're all here, is yeah. that shot at uh, making our own impact on the world. So one more question, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So what are three books that you would recommend to this audience? Um, so on the business side, uh, I would uh, recommend uh, the books Andy Grove wrote in terms of high output management, only the parents survive, et cetera. Um, on the sort of uh, novel side, um, the first 50 pages are awful, but I think The Wind Up Bird Chronicle is a really good book. Um, but it's really tough for the first 50 pages, and then it gets really interesting. Uh, it's the case for so many books. Why? Yeah, I know, right? So Why do they do that? Why do they do that? <laughs> and then in terms of, um, like, I guess, sci-fi, uh, I really liked uh, Ancillary Justice recently. I thought that was a good book. I think it won the Hugo and the Nebula or something. I think. I don't know if anybody knows. But I thought that was a pretty good book. I thought it got worse as the series progressed, but I thought the first one was good. Great. Well, thank you for the book recommendations. And uh, thank you for I mean, all the wisdom and advice. I learned a lot, uh, especially around I, li I like how you brought up a lot of counterfactuals. Like, why not to do a startup? Why not to raise money? Mm -hmm. You know. What, what is it? What are co-founder conflicts and you know raising money really about? It's about getting a product market fit, or um, you know, when can you start companies that will be successful that actually aren't born out of personal passion? Mm -hmm. I really appreciated being able to dispel a lot of these um, Silicon Valley myths. Oh, well, so, thanks for the conversation. Yeah, thanks so much. Let's give our speaker a hand of applause, and then we'll open up the audience questions. So if you would like to ask Alad a question, please raise your hand and we'll pass around the mic. Perfect, yay. Um, so I have two questions, but hopefully the second one is short. First one is, I think there's a lot of it that people talk in terms of, um, oh, I did this thing, I figured this out, or I have this dogma. But there's also a lot of luck. 
So how would you say are some tactics used to increase the probability of luck in your life? Oh, good question. Um, it depends on how you define luck. I feel like there's almost three types of luck. There's the uh, prepared luck, right? Like you have everything together and you happen to run into that person in the airport, but you're on top of your shit and you sell them on something and it's the deal that makes it, or whatever it is, right? Like, um, I think there's the, uh, you just fall into something uh, that somehow works out magically. And you sometimes see that in Silicon Valley, I think. Um, you know, the person who just randomly applied to Google and got a job there really early when they, they couldn't hire anybody and just did enormously well, but themselves aren't that great, but they just kind of showed up. Um, Woody Allen has this great quote that 90% of success is showing up. And I think the other 10% is follow up, you know, or follow through. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, de it depends on really what you mean by luck and whether it's prepared or unprepared. I think the unprepared, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, I think the prepared is all about, um, you know, uh, figuring out where you can uniquely do outsized things and then applying yourself uh, with enormous fortitude against those things. I like the show up and follow up part too. Um, so my second question, which I was told to ask is, do you like coffee or tea? Oh, did you talk to Nish or something? Yes. <laughs> oh man, the Nish work. So um, one of my co-founders at Color, um, is uh, this really awesome guy named Nish, and uh, somehow he always knows everybody. You're actually the second person who brought him up tonight. <laughs> and um, he's this really low-key guy, and he's, he does like beekeeping, and he's like really quirky and really smart, and, um, and so you'd always think, oh, he's just sort of that quiet, you know, cool, interesting guy, and he knows everybody. And so um, we started calling him the Nish work instead of the network, because <laughs> he's so plugged in, and he's also the person that Whenever we'd want to do background checks on somebody, he would know like three people that you could ask. So yeah, uh, the obvious answer is T. Yes. <laughs> that, that was the right answer, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good call. Um, hey, uh, thanks for coming. So you mentioned earlier like the difference between raising uh, VC versus like debt versus whatever. Um, I'm wondering if you have an opinion on like growth stage uh, funds and the difference between private equity versus like raising from VCs and the uh, the incentives that each of them have. Yeah, I think um, it depends on the stage of the company and its leverage. There's one or two private equity funds that have acted extremely badly in Silicon Valley. Um, so, for example, there's one that um, negotiated a term sheet with a very well-known company, and they signed it. And then they tried to renegotiate two weeks after they signed it because they basically said, hey, you don't have any leverage. You already signed a term sheet. You told everybody else you're not going with them. And so they acted extremely badly. They also acted badly in two companies uh, that I know of. And so a lot of the word in the venture community is don't talk to those, those people because they're going to screw you. Um, that's not true of every private equity firm. Uh, there's some good ones, but <coughs> there's also some bad actors. Do you think that's a function of the economics that they face, like the need to like return capital at like, 10% or like 40% gains, or is yeah. it like just the people and like the breed and that yeah. sort of thing? I think it's a mix of people who come from banking backgrounds as well as versus entrepreneurial backgrounds. Or, and I don't mean like banking, like, you know, they worked at an investment bank for two years. I mean like, you know, their entire 20, 30 year career was spent in banking and then they go into something. Or alternatively, I think it's driven by the complexity of deals that they normally have to structure to protect their downside. So in a private equity situation where you may be buying a company for a turnaround and you're trying to live off of its cash flows, you put in place a lot more covenants, but you also often put in place a lot more structure in terms of the financing itself. And what they tend to do is try and translate that as well as some of the hardball negotiating tactics that they've had in the private equity world, and they translate that directly into venture, and then it works out really badly because it's sort of a clash of worlds and of models. It's like you're so used to playing that game of psychology, and that's how you win deals that you don't know how to get it out, out exactly. of that mindset. Yeah. Um, Sorry, and if you wouldn't mind, one more question. Um, would you say it's a negative signal hiring or, or investing in growth stage companies which have like an ex McKinsey CEO because they're probably more likely to raise a uh, round from like private equity or that sort of thing? Oh, um, no, I mean, there's a bunch of people who uh, have worked at McKinsey in different roles over time that have done good stuff out here. I mean, Sundar, the CEO of Google, is an ex McKinsey person. Um, so I think it's more about, um, you know, what's the, I actually worked at McKinsey for a year. 
Um, <laughs> so it's self-serving. It, it's actually, so it's, it's after I got laid off from that startup, uh -huh. um, I consulted to one or two companies and I was running out of money and I joined McKinsey yeah. uh, for a year. And then I joined Google out of there. Um, so that's the thing that kept me alive in part uh, after I ran through all the, the network. Google actually still has a great pipeline of ex-McKinsey people going there. They have a ton of people there, yeah. yeah. Um, Nick Fox was at McKinsey and a few other folks. Um, oh, also, uh, gosh, I can picture her. I can't remember her name for some reason all of a sudden. Uh, she, she's on the board of Cisco now, and she sold a company to Cisco. Uh, I'll remember her name right after this, and then I'll feel really embarrassed, especially if it's being videotaped. Um, she's, <laughs> she's actually really great. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's more about what are the incentives of the person, what are they good at, you know. And honestly, I think there's a lot of very strong cultures and I find in general, when you hire somebody out of a strong culture, they're sometimes awful in their first job and great in their second job. So McKinsey's that way. I feel like McKinsey consultants, after their first, their first job out of McKinsey, if they've been there for many years, they are really bad uh, because they work a very specific way culturally and they value certain things. And then that gets broken in them. And then in their next job, they do great. Google people are sometimes that way. But there's the Google way of doing things. And Especially over Google infrastructure startup. And, exactly. And so, the first role out of a startup sometimes tough, and I'm ex Google too, so you know I'm talking bad about myself in every dimension. Um, but then in their second job, they're fantastic, and some of them are fantastic straight away. It's more just like strong cultures tend to build into people, and then when they go into a new culture, it breaks in both directions. More questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so, so now that you've written a book, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the book publishing mm. space, both. Yeah. From a tech person looking at book publishing, as well as what the publishing industry teaches you about tech the other way around uh, as well. So I was in an unusual situation where Stripe actually published my book. Um, and they're now going to publish about a book a month for the next couple months. And they have some really great things in the pipeline. And so I was very lucky in that I got to circumvent the traditional publishing process. And they were great partners and very supportive of doing this. So honestly, I don't have a lot of insights. I am working on a romance novel. So, uh, no, I'm joking. Um, so that'll be my traditional experience. So if anybody in the audience knows Fabio or has a line to him, I'm trying to get him as the cover model. So just let me know. And I was hoping the two of us could pose or something. On it. We have a book writer and a former entrepreneur here as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. If you know Fabio, whoever that person is, please let me know. <laughs> Henrik? Yeah. Um, so you were talking about sort of founder equity and sort of splitting equal or not, and you mentioned some examples. But I'm a little confused because I don't know if those, because a lot of the examples you brought up is sort of Drew and Rosh and sort of from Dropbox, and you saw it in the S1. But did they actually start out on equal, or they just end up? They started off on equal. They started off on equal? Yeah, okay. they started off on equal. Instagram started off on equal. LinkedIn started off on equal. Facebook started off on equal. Um, Microsoft, I'm not sure. It, it, it ended up on equal after Paul Allen left. Um, Amazon was really sole co-founder. Oracle was more or less sole co-founder when all was said and done. I think he may have had somebody in name. Intuit was very unequal. It was like, you know, 95 know five or that. whatever. Was that? I, I didn't even know there was a co-founder. I think there was. Scott Cook. I think it was called a co-founder, but I think it was really Scott Cook. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of inequality if you look at the biggest companies. Now, Google is the famous counterexample. And I know of a few sort of private companies that are very large where it's, it's basically an equal split. Um, but there's lots and lots of examples um, where it's, it's the other way around. And there's a few companies going public next year. And people will see the cap tables there. And, and some of those are unequal, too. And in some cases, quite unequal. Do, do, you, do you have any like insight on what is driving some of those the inequality in some of those examples? Like yeah. why they made the decision to be unequal? What was sort of like, yeah. how was that discussion done? I'm just cur like, yeah. really curious. I think in some cases, this differential value of the founders is quite explicit. So you could have somebody late in their career versus early, and sometimes that impacts it. I mean, Netscape, which was Mark Andreessen's first company, Jim Clark owned a lot more equity than Mark Andreessen did, because Jim Clark had started SGI, which was like the, the company of the era, right? And so um, sometimes it's very explicitly clear. Uh, and other times, um, you know, you have somebody who's really starting something, and then other people join a little bit later. Uh, in some cases, there's one person that the capital or or a venture community really wants to back. And so it's sort of perceived as that person bringing more value. It could be a variety of things. Cool, thanks.
And I'm not saying, by the way, it's the right answer. I'm just saying like there's lots of examples where that's a successful model. And people always talk about how, oh yeah, co-founders are always equal. And that's very false. Yeah, I'm just curious how yeah. Uh, I have two hiring related questions. So one, you talked about in startup speed is really key in hiring. What are some maybe tactical pieces of advice you have for how to measure the kind of more abstract like values of an individual in a very s speedy way? Yeah, I think, um, I think like all things, you wanna make sure that you're taking the time to assess it. So just like you wouldn't say, well, I'm gonna speed through their coding abilities if you're hiring an engineer. I think with values, it's the same thing. Um, what I found is that often when you're interviewing people, what you want to do is assign somebody who's going to dig into a specific topic with that person. So if you have five people on the team, you know you can kind of say you're going to bias more towards this question, and you're going to bias more towards that question, and you're going to bias more towards this other one. And there may be somebody that you just want to designate as a person who's going to delve more into values. I often find, too, that if you do something that's more socially oriented with a candidate, so a group of people take them for a coffee or for a walk or whatever it is, um, that people will act very differently in a social, a pseudo-social setting than they will if, if, if it's a pure interview. And so I've, I've seen a lot of behavior surface uh, in an informal environment that shouldn't have come out. And then you're like, wow, we really shouldn't hire this person. Um, the other question is a little bit more also related to C, but more on the kind of long arc of time, which is like, um, there's, I guess, one way a company can um, think about building in uh, kind of like diversity very early on and actually a unique pipeline of people and invest in that early. And then that also inevitably sometimes slows down the early hiring. So mm -hmm. how do you think about that trade-off? Oh, yeah. yeah, I think you just need to be uh, willing to explicitly make that trade-off. So I think it's one of those things where you say we're, we're um, you know, we're going to cast uh, a broad net and we're going to be thoughtful about who we want to hire early. And if it takes longer, we're fine with that. Um, and it doesn't have to take longer. I'm just saying, you know, especially if you're dealing with very small numbers, it's, it's, it's not too bad. If you're dealing with very large numbers, that's where it gets hard, in my opinion. Um, and so I, I do think you just want to make sure that you're, you're explicit about that commitment and everybody on the team understands why you're doing it. And then it doesn't become as much of an issue, in my opinion. I think the other thing you, you can do to help it along is make sure that early on, um, you know, diversity is represented at different levels of the company. So your angel investors who are helping to close candidates come from a more diverse pool, for example. So that, that may also help with the hiring process or the network. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot more talk in the last few years about like the unintended uh, negative consequences of technology and society. If you're trying to juggle making a company that works at all and one that has a net positive impact, like at what point should you actually be thinking about that and how should you do that? So is the question around uh, negativity in technology or how do you make sure oh, you're doing the right like thing? Like negative impact, so for example, I mean, yeah. so, like Facebook, Twitter <coughs> included, um, yeah. et cetera. Like, like, but there's also like smaller companies and things like Uber. Um, yeah. There are ways in which they might have negative impacts, ways in which they might be harming yeah. users or society at large. Sure. And where do you think about that in the stage of company formation? I see. How do you think about yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those sorts of values are baked in reasonably early and are often reflections of the founders um, or reflection of the first end people on the team. Um, and I think sometimes people course correct or they mature and they grow up and they start acting better. Uh, because, I mean, if you think about it, if you're 19 years old when you start a company, you just haven't seen that much and you may be immature and all the things that come with being 19. I mean, when I was 19, I was immature, right? And so imagine that you're hiring people and running a team and you know, uh, you're impacting lots of people. You may just not be at a stage of life where you understand even necessarily the implications of it. I'm not excusing anything. I'm just saying like trying to put myself in another person's position. That's how I think about it. Um, I do think that at some point um, you know, people need to own their shit and take responsibility for their actions and say, how am I really impacting the world and what should I be doing about it? <laughs> and that question should be something that people should be asking themselves as founders ongoing, right? Like it's, I think, a, a moment of self-reflection. And then I think that there should be mechanisms by which people in the company can raise these questions. Um, at Google, there was this guy, I think it was Larry Schwim, who would always ask the most awkward, pointed questions at all hands. He'd come up and people would be like, ah, oh, it's Larry again. <laughs> um, and he's awesome, right? But um, I need to ask the question that nobody else would ask. And that encouraged other people to then be very vocal. So I thought that was, he played a very important mechanism culturally in terms of asking the hard questions that, no, that everybody was too shy to do. And then the second he asked, 
people would flood up and start asking more things along those lines and really dig in. So I think there's, culture, there's mechanisms like that where maybe you hired the right person or maybe people in the background were encouraging him and saying, hey, you should keep asking that stuff. Um, so I do think you can also create a culture where you say, great, thank you for asking that. You know, afterwards, you go up to the person and say, thanks for, for raising that. It's good that you did. Um, I do think that every generation, society freaks out about the impact that technology is having on the next generation and how it's destroying it. So um, I don't know if people have read the book. There's this great book about the telegraph. Yes, it's great. Uh, yeah, and so it talks about all the behavior that, that happened on the telegraph in the 1800s where people were like trading jokes, they were dating online because they were dating through the, like all these telegraph operators were like dating, you know, and they were doing all the behavior that you see now online except they were doing it over a telegraph wire. And then in the early 1900s, we had yellow journalism and the rise of newspapers destroying politics by pulling different countries into wars, right? And so media was blamed for wars in the early 1900s, in some cases rightfully so. And then in the uh, 30s, you had radio and it was corrupting youth through music and through exposure to different ideas. And then you had TV, and it was turning everybody into a vegetable. And then um, in, the eight, in the 90s, we had video games. And they were turning all of our children into killers, right? Because they were playing violent video games. And now we have Instagram, and it's destroying our youth again. And it's turning them into terrible, self-indulgent people. And the last one's true. But in terms of... <laughs> But in terms of the rest of the entire span of history, like, my gosh, every 20, 30 years, there's the new media technology that's destroying politics and our youth and society and civil discourse. And it, it goes on and on and on and on. Now, don't get me wrong. I do think that some of those things really happen with each generation. But I think it's dramatically overstated if you actually look at the history of all this stuff. In your book, you mentioned, oh, you interviewed Keith Trubois, and he said that you should IPO as early as possible but no one is doing that. You should add, sorry? IPO, oh, IPO and yeah. a lot of companies don't do that. Yeah. What, what is your take on this? Um, I, I have sort of a few views on it. I think when all is said and done, um, an IPO is a tool for a company like any other, and uh, the people running that company should figure out if it's a good tool for them at the time. <coughs> so I don't have like a generic statement on it. I think the flip of it is, um, there is a generation of founders from 2008 to 2012 who for some reason have extra fear of going public or extra disdain for it. And I feel that the people before them and the people after them are actually much more comfortable with it. So I wouldn't be surprised if a number of companies from the sort of 2012 on vintage um, went public before some of the ones earlier on than that. And it almost feels a little bit generational to me, which I think is fascinating. Um, but I think like it's a tool and I think there's all sorts of positives to doing it. Um, you know, there's negatives too, but I think, uh, you know, like your competitors get very clear insights into your financials and what's working and not working in your business and things like that. But in reality, I think um, most of the things are positive. If you look at the arguments that are made against going public, um, there's a handful of them. Number one is you're going to be less innovative, right? Because you're going to be constrained by what Wall Street wants. If you were to ask at least me or potentially other people in the room, what are the most innovative companies? It's Google, it's Amazon, it's Apple. You know, it's, it's actually the big ones who are public. It's not you know, some small thing. Um, the other argument that's made is that uh, you're gonna, it's going to be harder to hire or you're going to hire the wrong people. And um, you know, a friend of mine runs a recruiting company and said that their data shows that when a company goes public, the conversion rates go up and they pay less for people because they believe the stock is liquid. Right? Um, so I think that's probably false. Um, there's more overhead in terms of being a public company because of regulation. Like, there's a few things that are real, but I think it's really overstated in terms of the negatives. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said about accountability. And sometimes that comes from the public markets rather than, you know, your investors as a, mm -hmm. you know, private company. Mm -hmm. Good point. I think we'll make this the last question, question and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, for first-time founders in those first few years, um, obviously you can learn a lot of everything you're trying to learn from just doing and from trial and error. But outside of that, what would you say are like the best things you can do to, you know, become a better founder? And how would you weigh your time spent on like operations and building the business versus becoming better? And how does that change over time of the of the company? Mm. Yeah, I think it depends on um, what stage company you're at and how you define better. Um, is the role of the founder to find product market fit? Is it to build and manage a team very effectively? 
is it to create social good. And each founder will have a different definition in terms of what they actually care about in terms of the output of their efforts. And so depending on how you define good, I think that feeds into the mechanisms by which you can become better. Um, so, you know. Let's say it's to find product market fit for like an earlier stage mm. company. Yeah, I think um, then it's really about uh, one, assembling a team of people who are actually good at finding product market fit or can help explore the market or are smart about exploring the market or can be coached into exploring the market effectively because that's really what's going to drive the product market fit. Um, you're obviously going to need people who are good at building product, so that's design, engineering, et cetera, and so being good at a subset of those skills um, will be, or alternatively being really good at selling. Uh, you know, one person I knew used to say that you're either, um, this is extreme I think, uh, but you're either building the product or you're selling it or you're overhead. And that isn't really true as things get later. I mean, you need management, you need HR, and you need a bunch of financial controls and you need all this other stuff, but you know, for very, very early companies that's, that's, that's pretty true in terms of you should be building something, you should be selling it, and you should be helping each other take care of the company more broadly. Um, and then, you know, I think if you can get good at management and uh, that side of things, it's really helpful. It cleans up a lot of mistakes. And if you're good at some simple processes, it helps a lot, and it cleans up a lot of mistakes, and it makes people happier and things run better. I've seen some really terribly run companies do very well. So if the sole goal is product market fit, I think it helps because you're aligning people better and you're getting more done faster. Uh, but sadly, I've seen really poorly run companies do very well. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for the time. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Aladd, so much for coming by. Right. Good discussion.